All right. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Is Sean here? We're having trouble streaming to Facebook. Hi, everybody. Thank you for those who are here watching on YouTube. We're having some technical difficulties streaming to our Facebook. Just give me one moment to get this situated. Okay, looks like our Facebook stream should be up and functioning. Thank you everyone who has joined us today. We're going to give it a couple of minutes to let folks join the call. Perfect, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for being here today. I'm gonna give it another minute or so before we start our presentation on the Chicago World's Fair today. get started in about 30 seconds. Thank you all so much for being here. ahead and get this program started. Thank you all so much for um, being here today. My name is Emily Levine. I'm the manager of adult services for programs and outreach at the Enoch Pratt Free Library. Thank you so much for joining us for the August edition of Lunch and Learn, Maryland at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair in partnership with the Maryland State Archives and the Maryland Four Centuries Project. If you have any questions or comments during this presentation, please make sure to put them in your respective streaming channels chat. And now I will turn it over to Bert to introduce today's speaker. Uh, thank you, Emily, and uh, welcome everyone to our monthly Lunch and Learn lecture. Thanks as always to our wonderful partners, the Maryland State Archives and the Enoch Pratt Free Library. And happy Defenders Day to all. Maryland has two special holidays all its own. On this day in 1814, Baltimore saved the country from serious trouble after the British had burned public buildings in Washington a few weeks earlier. That same event gave us the Star Spangled Banner and the end of the War of 1812. And the other holiday, by the way, is Maryland Day, March 21st, 1634, when the original Maryland settlers began their colony with a Catholic mass on St. Clement's Island in the Potomac, and then they moved to St. Mary's City. As a tracker of good history, I want to mention the Maryland's four centuries latest project, the Maryland Mosaic. We are in the anniversary business and three important anniversaries are coming up in the state. The US 250th in 2026, the Baltimore 300th in 2029, and Maryland's 400th in 2034. We are concentrating on Maryland's role in the 2026 US 250th. We are curating a Maryland mosaic. It's a digital collection of people, places, events, objects, documents, and buildings from all over Maryland that were firsts, very first for the nation. As a border state and with its proximity to the nation's capital, which by the way is sitting on Maryland land, the state has had an outsized role in American history. You will hear a lot more about our impact in the upcoming months. But for now, you can go to our website at www.MarylandMosaicOneWord.org and find out what we are up to. You can also see our Maryland First each Monday in our Maryland 400 page on Facebook and Instagram. Now to today's lecture, which focuses 
on the 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago. We talk a lot these days about living in interesting times. 1893 certainly fits that bill. Our big sprawling country was stretching from sea to sea for the first time, and we were beginning to get more attention on the world stage. It was also the end of the Gilded Age, and the country appeared to be coming off the rails. It had belching factories, very, very rich capitalists, and open worker rebellions against long work weeks, low wages, and very poor working conditions. Enter the Chicago's World Fair, one of the first in the modern world. Chicago was coming back from its own troubles. It was destroyed by fire in the 1870s, but reemerged as a bustling economic powerhouse. The exposition was an incredible demonstration of the whole country's dy dynamism and, by the way, self-congratulation. That was in spite of its troubles. Picking the 400th anniversary of Columbus's voyage as its theme, the fair covered 690 acres with exhibits from 45 world cultures and 35 states. And over one year, it was visited by 27 million people, all arriving by train and car. Well, not much car, obviously, at that point. It celebrated Columbus's voyage as an important achievement in our history. Maryland played a role as an exhibitor, which brings us to today's lecture. The Maryland State Archives has become an important player in remembering that fair as well as showing off its collections. Rachel Fraser, an accomplished archivist, has discovered an amazing resource of maps, photos, public documents, and letters buried in the stacks in Annapolis. The special collections in that place can be a real treasure trove, as she will demonstrate today. We will be treated to a pleasurable excursion into a Maryland showcase from 130 years in our past. And I can't think of a better guide for that excursion than the Deputy Director of Reference Services at the Archives. Please welcome Rachel Fraser. Thank you so much, Bert, and I am so excited to present today. Um, I'll give a little background on the Maryland State Archives for anyone who might be new to us, and then we will launch into our exciting presentation about these wonderful collections. So thank you for the wonderful introduction, Bert. I am going to share my slides. And let's make sure this all comes up all right. Um, let's see, there we go, good, perfect. So a little background on the Maryland State Archives, which holds the collection that it, and collections that inspired this entire presentation. The archives is the central repository for Maryland's government records of permanent value, as well as some wonderful special collections. As a reference archivist, I get to help people with historical, legal, and genealogical research in our collections dating back to the 1630s, as well as more modern legal needs. Our collections are vast, spanning state government records like court records, vital records, photographs, and religious records, plus much, much more. So our team of reference archivists never know what we're going to come across each day. We are focusing on placing records over 100 years online from home, an ongoing process, but there are records that are not yet online. So we love to have visitors uh, come in person to our newly renovated and redesigned research room to view those records that are still in just their paper form and not, not online yet. And among records not yet online, we often find lesser used collections that still can give us an incredible glimpse into human experiences. In fact, I've had a tradition of giving a Halloween talk each year, highlighting some of these unique items in our collections. Over the years, if you've been able to attend any of those talks, we've seen a lock of hair from the 1700s, pieces of a sunken battleship, newspaper articles on strange Halloween traditions and legendary cryptids. And a couple of years ago, this blueprint detailing the plans for something called the Maryland Building at the World's Columbian Exposition, also known as the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. It was in a box along with little designs like these that people submitted in a competition to have a souvenir medal designed to hand out at the fair representing Maryland. And the records um, 
were so were extensive enough that I could only feature a few in my Halloween presentation. They're part of a larger collection called T68, Accession Problems and Miscellaneous, which were only partially processed and our archivists continue to process and identify to this day. So when I finally took a deeper look one day, I found that this little box is full of seemingly dry and boring administrative files. But when I showed my colleagues some of what I was finding, we realized it was so fascinating, it had to become a full presentation. Now, I do not consider myself an historian or an expert on the Chicago World's Fair, Instead, my goal is to build understanding and appreciation for this incredible collection and its value to researchers. So to supplement the records I'll be featuring I, um, from T68, I also used other World's Fair records found in our special collections, um, secondary sources and historic newspapers. I'm very grateful to our director of special collections, Maria Day, for giving me some excellent secondary sources that were a huge help in this presentation. So we'll start with a little historical context, and then we will see what little secrets this box has for us to discover. So the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, officially called the Columbian Exposition, was designed to showcase science, technology, agriculture, industry, and the arts from throughout the world, but with a heavy focus on American innovation. And here's a little glimpse into the world the year that it opened. This is actually not a picture from the Chicago World's Fair. It is actually a photo of Government House in Annapolis, the governor's residence here in Annapolis, our state capital, built just over 20 years earlier in, in 1870. It is still a Victorian-style mansion in 1893, and it wasn't until 1935 that the facade was changed to look like a colonial mansion as we see today. In 1893, Frank Brown was elected Maryland's 42nd governor the year earlier. He had run as Farmer Brown, and he's a big proponent of the industrial and farming communities, and he will factor largely into Maryland's role at the fair. In 1893, Harriet Tubman, still unsurprisingly a visionary and activist in her 70s, is now involved in the women's suffrage movement. Thomas Edison has finished building the first motion picture studio in West Orange, New Jersey, and is starting a monopoly that will drive filmmakers to a little rural area called Hollywood, California. And Benjamin Harrison has ended his term as president and Grover Cleveland has become the 24th president. Amidst all of this, one of the biggest events on people's minds was the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. This was not nor the first nor the last international exposition hosted in the United States, but one of the most influential as and, and one of the earliest. As Robert W. Rydell notes in his book, All the World's Affair, Oh, I forgot to mention Oscar Wilde. He published three plays in 1893, living at the same time as Harriet Tubman. I mean, it's incredible. Um, let me actually move on from here, though. Okay, so, uh, so Robert Rydell in his book, All the World's Affair, he writes, between 1876 and 1916, nearly 100 million people visited the international expositions held in Philadelphia, New Orleans, Chicago, Atlanta, Nashville, Omaha, Buffalo, St. Louis, Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, and San Diego. The promoters of these extravaganzas attempted to boost the economic development of the cities and regions in which they were held, as well as to advance the material growth of the country at large." End quote. In 18, now, a few years before 1893, in 1890, the U.S. Congress had passed an act saying a World's Fair in the United States was to mark the 400 year anniversary from 1492. But people were often, were, most people were well aware that this was the only, only the nominal reason. It was, in fact, the nation's answer to the 1889 Exposition Universelle, which showcased similar themes and famously marked the debut of the Eiffel Tower, where this fair was held in Paris. Americans wanted to show how much the U.S. had to offer as a response. So where does Maryland come in? 
So let's now let's begin and dig into T68 and the administrative files created by Maryland's involvement in the Chicago World's Fair. Very few of these documents were in chronological order. They're organized more by subject matter. And there are still a few I have not studied yet, but I'm going to do my best to keep it in chronological order. Um, so Blinken, you could even miss this little document in a meeting at the Baltimore City Hall on December 14, 1891. A committee was formed as the Maryland State Board of Promotion to, quote, ascertain the probable cost of representing the interests of the city of Baltimore and the state of Maryland at the Columbian World's Fair, canvassing the city and state so that definite information to the needs of the intending exhibitors and proper space be secured. And then, so that's kind of the start of all of it, but then I found a letter dated just a month after the board met, and it's addressed from a Mrs. Reed to Governor Frank Brown. So here is an excerpt. My dear Mr. Brown, Mr. Norris tells me that there is some idea of a committee going to Annapolis to further the interests of the Columbian Exposition Bill to be brought up before the legislature next week. We'll go back to the rest of the letter in a second, but what is the bill they're mentioning? So there is a resource called the Archives of Maryland Online, which does not transcribe all of our collections. Uh, that would be a colossal feat, but it provides an amazing searchable database of historical documents that form, and I'll quote from our database uh, description, the constitutional, legal, legislative, judicial, and administrative basis of Maryland's government. So this includes acts passed by the Maryland legislature. I searched using the terms Columbian Exposition, and I found that a bill indeed was passed just a few months after the letter. Here is an excerpt. An act dated March 30th, 1892 in chapter 212 of the Laws of Maryland. It's to provide for the appointment of a commission for the collection, arrangement, and display of the products of the state of Maryland at the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893 and to make an appropriation therefore. And it's stating that the natural resources, industrial development, and general progress of the state of Maryland should be fully and creditably displayed to the world at said exposition. It also formally establishes the Board of World's Fair Managers of Maryland, which shall consist of 11 residents of the state of Maryland with the governor as the chair. And aside from basic expenses, they're not paid positions. This is really important because as I was looking through that clamshell, that, that little box I showed you in T68, I was trying to figure out the provenance and little by little, I realized these were the records of the Board of World's Fair Managers of Maryland. So we're going to process it more fully as a government collection. And we're working on having it digitized and made accessible um, online eventually, which will be really exciting. Now the act instructed the comptroller to give $50,000 from the state treasury to the commission and an additional 10,000 as an emergency fund. So as far as the timeline goes, this gives the board just about a year before the May 1893 opening of the fair. So who comprised the board? Now we hold a collection outside of T68 called the Governor's Letter Book covering 1838 to 1896, which includes copies of letters from Maryland's governor, Frank Brown, and he sent a decent number of letters to Maryland officials and staff who were asking for the list of the members of the board. I mean, because this is pre-internet, they couldn't really Google it like we can nowadays. So he had quite a few letters actually listing exactly who the members were. It lists himself, Governor Frank Brown, also lists Ferdinand C. Latrobe, who was the mayor of Baltimore City at the time, um, as the secretary. He's also the grandson of Ferdinand Latrobe, who designed the U.S. Capitol building. Um, we also have J. Olney Norris, Chamber of Commerce, who is also secretary. I find his name a ton in the administrative files. He's doing a ton of coordination with vendors and planning and all sorts of things. It also miss mentions a Mrs. William Reed of 825 St. Paul Street of Baltimore City. That is actually the author of the letter that had been addressing uh, my dear Mr. Brown um, a few months earlier. And I'd love for you to see the way she ended her letter. She says, I feel sure 
that we are safe in your hands and that you will not allow women's interests to suffer in our state. Yours sincerely, E. MCK Reed, 825 St. Uh, Paul Street. That's Emily McKim Reed. She's from the Board of Ladies Managers World's Columbian Exposition, which is on her letterhead. And I think that is a fantastic tidbit to find in the advocacy that's going on to try to represent um, Marylanders in the fair and accurately uh, represent their contributions. Now, prior to Maryland's act, work had already begun on negotiating a location for a Maryland building, but the act provided the support needed, the financial support. So in 18, January of 1892, a few months before the act was passed, the Baltimore Sun reported that J. Olney Norris had just returned from Chicago after negotiating a larger site for Maryland's building, which was to be well situated at the corner of two avenues being created in Chicago, I'm sorry, Jackson Park, Chicago, where the fair um, would be held. Oops, let me back up a second, there we go. Um, and according to an 1891 article of the Scientific American, as a side note, you'll notice I'm using a lot of newspapers and um, periodicals, which if you're doing genealogy, historical research, trying to learn historical context about an event or collection like I am, newspapers and um, periodicals can be really be your best friend. There definitely can be errors or things misreported, but it is a great first step in knowing what's going on. So these have been fantastic to learn about the historical context for this presentation. So this is from an 1891 article in the Scientific American and the fair um, is planned as mainly located in Jackson Park, Chicago, including a midway, a mile long, boulevards, artificial lagoons and canals, with visitors even able to access the park by cable car, railroad and water. And there are buildings dedicated to the arts, horticulture, transportation, machinery and more with buildings for the states and foreign governments being built in the area of the north section of Jackson Park. So we know Mrs. Reed was keeping an eye on the representation of women. And in fact, thanks to newspapers, the whole public was watching the development of the fair. And in the same administrative files on April 25th, 1892, just a month after the act established the Maryland Board of World's Fair Managers, Governor Frank Brown received another letter, this time from a Joseph Selden Davis. The letter I'm going to show you is what prompted us to have the entire collection scanned because we realized just how significant it is to history. And many thanks to Chris Haley, when I showed him the letter, he gave us a recommendation to digitize this collection because of its value. So the letter is typed with Governor Brown's name written in or stamped in so that it was likely was sent to other members of the World's Fair Commission as well. Like when you send the same email to different individuals, I think that might be what's happening. Um, I won't read the entire thing, but here are some excerpts. Davis writes, I have felt very great interest in regard to what display Maryland would make at Chicago. And he says he expects planning will start for a state exhibit soon. He then advocates for, quote, equitable recognition, end quote, for the contributions of African-American Marylanders who are excelling in business and education, who, and I'll quote directly from the letter, number more than one fifth of our state population who pay taxes on several million dollars worth of property. And as agriculturalists, inventors, and mechanics, they are taking no mean rank, end quote. An African-American lawyer and activist from Baltimore, Joseph Selden Davis's accomplishments and advocacy appear throughout newspapers in the 1880s, especially the Baltimore Sun, and into the 1890s with his constant work in furthering education. Some of this context is really important to remember for later on in the presentation. You can access um, a text searchable database of the Baltimore Sun with a Maryland library card. Um, you can get excellent access through Enoch Pratt, and it is a great resource for research. Here's a little extra historical context. So in 1887, he co-wrote a report on the condition of the segregated schools for African-American children in Baltimore, finding that the school capacity of 6,000 students fell far short of the actual student population need of 14,000 students. Um, in 1888, he signed a petition along with other members of the Baltimore City School of, quote, a manual, 
a manual training school so that African-American boys would have, and quoting from his report of the petition, have all the same advantages now possessed by white pupils because those training schools were segregated and nothing existed for African-American children. We're gonna to return to Joseph S. Davis again in a little while, but his recommendations, I find they were far more uh, thought out than some of the other ones I found. Um, especially one that I found reported in the newspapers and the administrative files. There was a major J.G. Pangborn, I hope I'm saying his name right, and he insisted the only way to get non-Marylanders to visit the Maryland building, he insisted, he's like, oh, only Marylanders are going to visit. He said, well, you can get a lot of other people to visit from uh, in the fair if they're from other countries, other states. They'll want to visit. You just need to make it in the shape of a giant oyster. So um, that did not happen. <laughs> so quick recap. The commission was established in March 1892. Well, backing up, the Exposition Universelle in Paris is 18, in 1889. The commission is established in March 1892 following the Act of Congress. The World's Fair was to open in May 1893. So pretty breakneck speed with only about a year to take bids, purchase materials, plan exhibitions, and plan and construct the building Letters in T68 revealed the construction as extremely relaxing and lovely, no, stressful and hectic. <laughs> so many of the bids they received from businesses throughout the state, um, of, of all of the bids, the winning bid to build the Maryland State Building at the fair went to F. Mertens and Sons of Allegheny County, who contacted the building committee in May, 1892. We can actually see their letter contacting them. They saw an advertisement in the newspaper. They clearly had to hit the ground running because I found a July 1892 letter in our files, um, which in which F. Merchants tells Secretary J. Olney Norris, please tell the Maryland Building Company to hurry, hurry, hurry. And I love the additional underlines. Um, Letters show disputes and fighting over the next months. It includes some drama when what was expected to be a donate, a free gratis donation of plaster walls shown in this patent drawing end up being a cost of $1,000, which is a lot back then. Um, in August, we also find a letter noting that they had paid $16,000 just for lumber. So it's getting more and more impressive what they did with a 50,000 to, in an emergency, $60,000 budget. Um, however, progress continues and we find a letter dated um, October 3rd um, of 1892 from D.H. Burnham to J. Olney Norris, Secretary of the State Board of World's Fair Managers for Maryland. And I have a feeling some of you may already know the name D.H. Burnham if you have an interest in the World's Fair. A portion reads, I enclose herewith and for execution by your board, three copies of the formal contract which the world's Columbian Exposition is entering into with all states and territories erecting buildings on sites in the World's Fairgrounds. The letter also has several like suggestions to ensure that the state's architects design buildings that have harmonious designs with the rest of the fair, which makes total sense. So this letter in our collections from D.H. Burnham's office is finalizing Maryland's construction of our own pavilion at the Chicago World's Fair. Now, D.H. Burnham was Daniel Burnham. He's one of the main designers of the fair. Among Burnham's company's long list of designs are the Flatiron Building in New York City and Union Station in Washington, D.C. Another main designer involved was Frederick Law Olmsted. And if you've been to Central Park in New York, which is gorgeous, that was the vision of Olmsted. Um, even as Marylanders worked frantically to construct a building at the fair, they also had to find ways to convey Maryland's rich history and resources. I keep finding something noted in a number of files that they chose to do so not only through exhibitions, but also through a building whose features would pay tribute to the state. So what did the building actually look like? And we'll also look into what the exhibitions were. So this leads us to a very interesting mystery that we did not know was a mystery that is now solved. In the original promotions for this talk, 
I had included a photograph from our collections that was attributed to the Maryland building at the Chicago World's Fair. Interestingly enough, I thought it was fascinating. It looks a lot like the Homewood House in Baltimore. And um, it looks, I mean, it has kind of the um, similar portico, very similar setup, the brick. Uh, it has been identified as the Maryland building at the Chicago World's Fair in our collections since the 90s. However, as I studied the administrative files in T68, I found out this photo was misattributed. It is the Homewood House in Baltimore. It's actually not the Maryland building. So our special collections department, we're going to work on, on correcting the catalog. So it's not that it looks like the Homewood House. It is the Homewood House. I think the reason for the misattribution, which could have been from the donor, the photograph, the original catalog, we don't really know, is that when you look at specifications, which we're going to look at for the building, the portico has a very similar design. So it is understand understandable. Um, and let's look up further into our box of administrative files and find out what the building actually looked like. On either November 29th or 30th, 1892, J. Olney Norris and members of the Maryland Building Committee traveled by the BNO Railroad to inspect the building's progress six months before the fair would open. I'm not sure if um, it was the 29th or 30th because F. Mertens wasn't sure either. And in fact, he sent a really exasperated letter to the building committee trying to get a straight answer on the date. And I'll just read a little excerpt. On the 23rd, and this is him uh, writing to the building commission. On the 23rd, you write the committee will arrive in Chicago on the morning of November 29th or a day sooner. November 26th, Mr. Norris writes that the committee leaves Tuesday at 11.45, reaching Chicago morning of the 30th. Please wire us which is correct. Does the committee leave Baltimore? He's just so exasperated. It's like your typical exasperated work email. But I think the visit went well in the end because on December 1st, 1892, just a day or two after the committee's arrival, the Baltimore Sun ran an article entitled Maryland Building, one of the most attractive structures on the World's Fair grounds. And I realized because it's the Baltimore Sun, they're probably biased just like I am. I want our building to be the most beautiful one, but it gives readers a look at the building's appearance. This is really nice. Um, it's not super detailed because it is a print in a newspaper. And here at the archives, we actually have something nicer. We have the print that the Baltimore Sun actually based it on. Thanks again to the administrative files in collection T68. So now we can see a far more detailed view of what the building design looked like. And it is far different from the photo we had shown earlier, but you'll see the portico is very similar. Now we can see what the Baltimore Sun called a Belvedere at the top, um, which they said gave, quote, a fine point of vantage for viewing the world's fairgrounds, unquote. We can even supplement this with the written specifications that I found in the letters going back and forth that were preserved in the administrative files. So to quote, um, actually paraphrase, because <laughs> it'll be a little bit longer if I quote directly. To quick par paraphrase, the lights were to be electric, which fit with the fair's showcasing of modern advancements. The flues were to be made of terracotta and there were two marble mantles. It would have both, uh, it would have both a portico, the front porch that we see here and a rear porch. Along with our state seal on display, there would be county flags banners and seals and you can see the banners flying along the top of the building they were supposed to represent all of the counties in existence at the time the building would span 116 feet by 230 feet approximately um, the front portico had that ornamental gable it has the maryland coat of arms in relief according to the specifications and that is designed as a deliberate tribute to our beautiful maryland state house um, here in annapolis now, F. Mertens and Sons, they wrote that the color department of the World's Fair, this is not the color department for Maryland, it's the color department for the entire World's Fair. They have suggested colors. They recommended making the trim white, but then they suggest colors for the rest of the building, which actually match up with something else that our conservation department actually found 
in the administrative files. The colors they give is are buff, red, brown, olive green, and drab. But we do not actually have to try to imagine what those shades would be. It turns out that our collection includes paint chips, um, paint samples. And that is one of the most incredible finds, along with Joseph Selden Davis's letters, I think, um, in this collection. They say the body of the building is going to be buff here. The metal roofs, et cetera, red brown there. The canvas roofs are supposed to be olive green and the porch steps and parapet, parapets are drab. Because these were not exposed to the light, um, they have been so well preserved and it's just beautiful. These are just a few details from hundreds of pages of correspondence. And it's a good reminder that while historical photographs and etchings are generally black and white, the world around people throughout history is often in full color. Uh, in a special correspondence, the Baltimore Sun reported that, quote, the building itself is a combination of the Maryland State House in Annapolis and a colonial mansion. It is imposing of graceful proportions and just the kind of place that Marylanders like. <laughs> now, what about the exhibitions? So the focus on exhibitions had landed mainly on showing our natural resources with some additional exhibitions on our history and culture. They had not thankfully taking Major Pangborn's advice to make the Maryland building look like a giant oyster. But according to newspapers, they had put him in charge of the b &O Railroad Company's exhibition elsewhere on the world's railways. So hopefully that kept him busy. Um, receipts for purchases give us some clues of what our ex exhibitions actually were. For example, I found a receipt saying we got museum jars for displaying soil samples. There's also a bill uh, for the Maryland Agricultural College, now the University of Maryland, paying a professor Silverster for tobacco to display, which is a huge heritage crop in Maryland, um, or was. The newspapers are also a big help. According to several reports from the Baltimore Sun, we learn more about the exhibitions that visitors experienced. Quoting from the Baltimore Sun on June 21st, 1893, in an article entitled, The State Buildings, Delightful Home Spots on the World's Fairgrounds. They say, the largest single exhibit is of the oyster industry. The catching and canning of the bivalve is shown in miniature in a large tank in which there are dredge boats, miniature dredge boats, a police steamer and a packing house on the wharf. In this tank are also, this part makes me a little sad, are also diamondback terrapin, which by the way, are having a hard time of it in fresh water. <laughs> so sad. The sun, so the sun goes on to say that um, other exhibitions include photographs of prominent um, state buildings and municipal structures, parks, major cities, and monuments, as well as some needlework, paintings, relics of the revolutionary period, and artistic furniture. Um, this, they also report they were impressed by all that was done with limited funding. $50,000 doesn't sound like a lot today, but it actually wasn't all that much back then for something of this scale. And they say they were especially impressed because they applied the funding um, from ranging from the building itself to furniture, to exhibitions, to, and I'm gonna quote here, the elaborate book describing the state's resources. So as an archivist, of course, my ears perked right up. I was like, an elaborate book? What? So I think it's really sad that we can't see what that book looked like or what was in it, right? Um, so many states did create books on, the, on their history for the fair, like a reference book or an encyclopedia. Maryland did so as well. And I was lucky to find references to the book in the administration files in T68. And it was created by, um, through collaboration with Johns Hopkins University and sent to everyone on the Maryland Board of World's Fair Managers before it was put on display at the fair. And the creation of this book received so much praise to the point that Johns Hopkins wanted to create a greater number of published volumes. And that's when a light bulb went off for me because if there are numerous publications, there's a chance that some might have survived. And what better place to search for it than at an archives? So the Maryland State Archives has a uh, wonderful library uh, covering historical and genealogical subjects, 
including some out of print publications. So I searched our library catalog and found that we have the book in our collections. You can actually request this hardbound print, this hardbound copy printed in originally in 1893 if you visit in person. It is in good condition to circulate. So in an era before the internet, Maryland's providing a reference book to visitors to the World's Fair so that they can learn about our state. A portion within the book reads, the great diversity in the physical features of Maryland with its consequent effort upon the climate renders a characterization of the temperature of the state as a whole quite impossible, but they still do their best to explain what it's like to live in Maryland, our history and our natural resources. Um, the book received praise, though one newspaper in 1893, one reporter complained that people would not have the attention span to want to sit down and read it even back then. The volume includes stuff, but I mean, it just shows how, yes, we, we say that we have shorter attention spans now. Even back then, people often had a hard time sitting down and reading through an entire book at once. Um, I think the reporter was just being a little cynical too. Um, the volume includes stunning illustrations of Maryland oysters, for example, and their anatomy. One of the main focuses of the Maryland Pavilion was oystering in Maryland. And this was Maryland in the 1890s when oystering was such a booming industry that we, according to this book, we were not only harvesting oysters from the bay for ourselves, but according to this book, we also were exporting them to other states. And I came across something that I really was a little hard to get through because hindsight is 2020. Um, I love oysters, especially oysters Rockefeller, but in a truly gut-wrenching example of pride coming before the fall, there is a passage about oystering that's pretty rough. Um, it boasts that once European settlers arrived, the book brags that they found an incredibly efficient way to harvest way more oysters than done before. And isn't that awesome? A huge focus, I mean, a huge focus of the fair was innovation, but unfortunately, we know that didn't go well, especially as Marylanders with our awareness of issues with the Chesapeake Bay and, and um, needing to reintroduce far more oysters again. And supporters of protecting oyster populations um, from poaching have compared this to the near extinction of bison in the West by settlers, since we do see that detriment of the effects um, you know, of over -har harvesting to this day. This is not my area of expertise. I'm very thankful to my dad who uh, gave me context because he previously chaired a steering committee for the state tourism board to advocate about how to deal with the, the issue with oysters in the Chesapeake Bay. So when you have the modern context of research being done and looking at historical record, it can give a lot of context of where maybe there wasn't full foresight. Um, still a fascinating book with incredible illustrations and also a time capsule in every way. But going back a little ways, what about the letter of Joseph Selden Davis? I mentioned it earlier when he had advocated for having um, African-American Marylanders represented. We've seen exhibitions that represent our natural resources, um, this book that covers a lot of our state resources and history, um, but, um, and beautiful illustrations of oystermen on the water. But I have found no evidence of him actually being invited to participate. Ultimately, I found something pretty tragic by searching newspapers and our vital records at the archives because less than nine months after writing to Governor Brown advocating for more diverse inclusion in the World's Fair, just like he had advocated for education and manual training for, uh, for children, for education for, for kids, he was very much an activist and an act advocate. But so nine, less than nine months after that letter, Joseph Selden actually passed away at the age of only 32, which was extremely sad for me to find, because um, who knows what he would have accomplished had he lived longer, because he seemed to be doing so much. Um, with Davis gone, another Marylander still showed a pro powerful presence at the fair, Frederick Douglass, having previously served as US minister and general consul to Haiti, he was actually at the Haiti Pavilion and he contributed to pamphlets expressing concerns over the lack of full representation at the World's Fair. Um, while many innovations were featured at the fair and Maryland won quite a few awards that I will feature shortly, 
It also is a snapshot of attempts to keep the status quo, attempts to challenge it. You know, the fair doesn't exist in a bubble, and it shows many of the issues going on in the United States and Maryland at the time. So one of the valuable things I found in digging through the administrative files of our involvement in the World's Fair is that it's given a glimpse into the lives of Marylanders and issues that were going on at the time. And Joseph Seldes, Selden Davis's letter is one of the best examples. So moving on, we have now made it to the fair's opening in 18, May 1893. They've created the building, they've designed the exhibitions, and a newspaper in our collections reports that hundred of uh, the American Sentinel reports 150,000 to 175,000 people gathered for the inauguration ceremony. The Sentinel also reports that so many people pressed in to enter that women fainted. It really focused a lot on the women fainting aspect. Um, kind of like in this photo, as you can see, this woman's having a horrible time. She looks so miserable. <laughs> Um, but it just shows what you read in the newspaper. It's very helpful. It doesn't always show the whole picture and they usually pick up what's sensational because she seems to be having a delightful time. Um, many Marylanders traveled from our state to visit the fair. The Afro-American reported from Baltimore that Miss Emma Jones left the city on Wednesday, Baltimore City, for Chicago, where she will spend the World's Fair season. And I love imagining that we're traveling to the fair, but I you don't really have to imagine. We can actually let a Marylander tell us what they experienced. It's one of my favorite things about being an archivist, finding records that let us really connect across the centuries. So this is not in T68. This is actually in the Lillian D. Jennifer collection here at the Maryland State Archives. And it's a great supplement to what we're, we're talking about today. This includes a tiny wallet, ticket stubs, and a notebook. Let's imagine that it's ours, our wallet, our tickets, our notebook that we take along with us. Because if we were visiting the fair, let's say just like this person on October 7th, we take Pullman's Palace cars from Baltimore to Chicago, riding in birth 11. And by October 9th, 1893, we are finally exploring the long awaited fair. And this is the ticket for October 9th, 1893, for the Chicago World's Fair that is in our collection. It was a fantastic find. And uh, it is Saturday. The crowded fair we're exploring is Jackson Park, um, is at Jackson Park. And the Maryland State Archives own collections can show us what many of these buildings looked like. Since one of our reference archivists, Morgan Miller, came across this beautiful little pamphlet in our collection that the Schreiner Milling Company was handing out as a brochure at the fair. According to the notebook, oh, let me back up a little. So um, the, this little pamphlet that they're handing out, it has a beautiful um, spread showing the design of the spread of the fair, which is really amazing. We're gonna have images that will show of where this person is going, but this is the notebook that they were writing in as they were exploring the fair. As they wandered, they saw, we can say we saw, if we're imagining it's us, a cow carved in salt and silver crystals from the Elkhorn mine in Montana. That would have been in the mining building. We also can see something else in the mining building. Marylanders, we had our own building, but Marylanders were, had entries in the fair, which you could compete for with for awards throughout the many buildings. So in the mining building, um, we have the Consolidated Coal Company of Frostburg, which won for bitumin bituminous coal, I'm probably butchering that, George's Creek Coal and Iron Company of Baltimore won for a block of coal. And the Manufacturer's Record Publishing Company um, one for a manufacturer's record. I really want to learn more about what this actually means because it would be fascinating, especially for historians specializing in this kind of history. We also can get to see something unforgettable, which is the skeleton of a whale, 47 feet long and 48 feet in girth at the fisheries building. In that same building, um, E. James Tull of Pocomoke won an award for his model Chesapeake Bay bug eye oyster boat. It's a type of oyster boat. As we move through the fair, we're seeing incredible objects like um, the first, sorry, the first balls fired at Fort Sumter 
on April 3rd, 1861, which is noted in that little notebook as they're walking around. We have the U.S. Capitol Dome done in everlasting flowers. When our uh, mysterious Marylander, we don't know the name for sure, wrote about that, they were looking at a U.S. Capitol Dome created of artificial flowers, but they called it everlasting flowers. Also saw a horse and rider made of prunes and a pyramid made of bottles of olive oil. They especially were fascinated by the women's building. It seemed to have left an impression where we can see beautiful paintings on the walls of the California room. And they especially loved the lace work by a fellow Marylander named Clara Cox of Kirkham, Maryland, which is on the Eastern shore. Now the machinery building has an especially interesting um, note because when they arrived at the machinery building, they made a note, they saw a lawnmower, which back then was something really interesting to, to uh, be able to observe. Now, Maryland has won further awards here, and I honestly can't go through all of them, but we're gonna circle back on the awards as we uh, in a bit as we close. But first, I do want to say our mysterious Marylander who kept their notebook while wandering around the fair may not be a total mystery after all, um, it's in the uh, Lily and Jennifer collection, but the notebook doesn't have a name in it. Um, so it could have been her, it could have been another, I mean, it could have been any family member or ancestor of hers. Um, they don't mention if they even visited the Maryland State Building, but one advantage of the Maryland Building is that they kept a log of all visitors to it including any from Maryland. And that visitor's log is in the Maryland State Archives collections. And I have to thank archivist Jenna Abbott who told me about this. Now the first visitor uh, to sign the register was J. Olney Norris on May 1st as a member of the building committee when the fair first opens. But then on October 9th, because these logs are dated, October 9th is the day that we find the ticket for the Marylander who kept the notebook. That is, uh, the day that we found Thomas R. Jennifer signing the visitor log. The Jennifer family was prominent in Maryland and is the name of the, uh, the family collection in which the notebook appears. Now, according to the Maryland Manual Online, Thomas R. Jennifer was sheriff of Baltimore County from 1891 to 1893, and he resided in Loch Raven of Baltimore County, Maryland. We also see that even though the building was not created as a giant oyster, as uh, Major Pangborn had insisted would be the only way to draw in people outside of Maryland, having our beautiful building designed the way it was did draw in a wide variety of visitors. In the log, and I've only gone through a tiny bit of it, we find people from Alabama, California, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, Kansas, Ohio, even London. Now, I mentioned some of the awards that Marylanders won, which are listed fully in T68's administrative files. But there are so many that we don't even have time to cover them all. To give you an idea, I started transcribing them and it is massive. Now I do want to point out one thing. Do you remember um, when I mentioned um, Joseph, before Gels, Joseph Selden Davis passed away, he'd advocated for the creation of a manual training school for African-American boys since only a school for white children existed. Even though he passed, his advocacy paid off because take a look at one of the award recipients. So his advocacy still made a difference even after he passed away. And with that, I want to thank you for attending this talk on Maryland's role at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. And I hope that this highlights the incredible value of this collection in studying the lives of Marylanders and their amazing contributions, struggles, and triumphs. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for that talk, Rachel. It was really, really fascinating. Um, we do have a few questions uh, here in the chat for you. Um, it looks like Betty has a couple. Um, she's asking how many people visited 
the Maryland exhibition and how many were Marylanders. So you kind of start to touch on that. Can you talk about that? Yes, actually. So when I mentioned that, uh, so Chris Haley, who is, um, he's the head of uh, research and he's director of the study of legacy of slavery uh, in Maryland. We were talking about that register and he said, you know, that would be a really great volunteer project if we could get it uh, transcribed so we could know you know, in a database, who like who attended, where are they from, how many are families, and if that could ever happen, that would give us great statistics because, yeah, I think it would be excellent to be able to learn that. Mm -hmm. And speaking of things that you had wanted to get online, WLSM with the cutest little meme cat asks, asks us if there's any link to the archives discussed, which I think you had addressed. So that's coming soon, right? Yeah, we're working on it. So we've digitized the, uh, for this collection that the T68 World's mm -hmm. Fair collections are, yeah. So we have digitized it, which is great. It's being processed. Our goal is, well, so our goal in general is to get records online that are over a hundred years old. And this certainly is. So yes, that is the goal to get it online for researchers. Um, I've, as I've gone through the files for research, I am trying to catalog everything I'm seeing. We've also had interns previously work on cataloging, but I'm trying to go a little more detail. So we're hoping that it won't just be getting it online, but also with exactly what is in each um, each folder of those. So yes, that will be coming. Cool. Um, you showed us that wonderful um, drawing of the Homewood House um, and how it related to the collection in a way that you didn't expect. And Linda is asking, um, where the Homewood House campus was, if it was on the JHU campus, and if it wasn't, where it where it is? I actually don't know the history. I believe it's Johns Hopkins campus, um, but I don't know like how long it was. Um, someone who is more well versed, and I think honestly, because I'm from the Annapolis area, it should have clicked instantly that it was the Homewood House if I'd been from Baltimore. But it took a little while for me to realize it. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I think if we looked into the, the, so the Homewood House is now, I believe, a museum. If you look online, it should give us some history of, um, of of how long it's been and what its relationship is to the the Johns Hopkins University campus, where I believe it's currently located. I just posted the link in the chat for folks. It's currently on the JHU campus, and it's wonderful. Yes, um, it's really really cool. Um, one final question to wrap up. Betty is asking. I think I know the answer to this question, but I would love to hear from an archival perspective. Can you talk about how African Americans from Maryland are represented at the fair? Right. And that was the issue that I found is I didn't find a lot of representation. I was really disappointed. I found the award that the, the school children won. So represented in that way, I did find that a, that it really was limited. And I think that's why Frederick Douglass really had spoken out about that limitation. In fact, we were running short on time. I didn't get a chance to read his full quote, but hold on one second. Yes. So he had collaborated with um, Ida B. Wells in creating a pamphlet um, that actually voiced concerns over lack of representation of African Americans at the Chicago World's Fair. So I have a couple of quotes. Wells herself, she wrote, the exhibit of the progress made in 25 years of freedom against 250 years of slavery would have been the greatest tribute to the greatness and progressiveness of American institutions, which could have been shown the world. And that is incredibly powerful. And she's basically saying, you have missed the boat on this. And Douglas himself wrote that what was gained by the war, they have partly lost by peace, saying that this is not representing the, all of the advancements that made through freedom and African-Americans. So there wasn't a lot of representation. I did find that um, the couple who, uh, served at the Maryland building to um, take care of the exhibits, to welcome people. A lot of two of them were African-American, but that was only a role of, of working there. It wasn't representing the contributions of African-American American Marylanders as like innovators or farmers or things like that. And I think that's why Joseph Selden Davis felt that need to write that letter is he saw that it wasn't moving in that direction. So mm -hmm. it's it really is a time capsule of those really short-sighted issues back then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for those who are interested, the full transcription of Frederick Douglass's speech at the Chicago World's Fair is online, and it's actually a really great read. Um, wow, okay, we only have a minute left, but I do want to get to a couple more of these questions. The Gatehouse says, we'd be happy to take visitors at the Sykesville Gatehouse Museum interested in the hometown of Frank Brown. Okay, thank you so much for that comment. Thank you. Um, and again, WLSM with your cute cat meme. I think you're adorable. Um, says... Oh 
was were any oysters transferred to Chicago? Was there enough seafood transportation technology? Um, <laughs> I'm not, I'll have to look more in depth at the administrative files because I got the impression there were a lot of like there were the drawings. I mean the the prints in the book. Um, it's not clear to me if they actually transported oysters and had them in water there or if they were models. Mm -hmm. So I'd have to study the administrative files a little more. They definitely transported live terrapins who weren't doing great. So maybe they transported <laughs> oysters. Well, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. And for those who would like to know more about the Chicago World's Fair and Maryland exhibition, um, Rachel can be found at the Maryland State Archives. And I also posted a link to Eric Larson's book, The Devil in the White City. Um, so, so thank you all so much for, for being here today. And thank you, Rachel, for an informative and engaging presentation. I'd also love to thank our partners at the Maryland State Archives and the Maryland Four Centuries Project. Um, thank you to our audience for joining us this afternoon. And we hope to see you next month. Everybody stay safe and take care. This concludes today's presentation. Thank you all so much for being here. Oh, great talk. Wonderful. All right. Thank you all. Thank you so much.